We're now going back to the origins of public key cryptography, namely to the paper by Dave and Hellman, in which they introduced the concept of public key cryptography. And in that paper, they also introduced a key exchange, which is now known as the Diffie Hellman key exchange. So in this key exchange, Alice and Bob both own a key pair. So Alice has a private key and a public key, and Bob also has a private key and a public key. And as you can see from the diagram here, all these four keys are going to be involved in sending a message from Alice to Bob. Now, Eve in the middle only sees the public keys. She doesn't have access to the secret keys, but Alice has her secret key and Bob has his secret key. Now, this exchange will work if one can combine the keys in a certain way. So let's first see what this key exchange is taking. So it takes Alice's private key over on the left here and Bob's public key. So Bob's public key anybody knows, but only Alice knows her private key. And then it combines those two things into something that is used to encrypt the message. So the message comes in, gets encrypted by this combination of Alice's private key and Bob's public key, then gets sent across the internet, well, past Eve, and gets sent to Bob. And then Bob, in order to decrypt this into the original message, what he takes is his private key and Alice's public key. So here we have Alice's public key, Bob's private key, and for the encryption, we had Alice's private key and Bob's public key. And so the system works if those two key combinations give the same shared key. Now this shared key can then be used um, for symmetric photography. So then we're getting the whole machinery that you have seen already, um, meaning you have a block cipher with a mode or you have a stream cipher and you have a Mac for authentication and integrity protection. And both of those things will use the shared secret. So the reason this is called public key authenticated encryption as opposed to what you've seen before, namely symmetric key authenticated encryption, is that here Alice's or Bob's public key also gets mixed in, depending on which, which side you're looking at. Now let's talk about this in more mathematical terms. So on the math side, we need to start with a group. So there is some generator G, we typically work in a, in a cyclic group, so there is some generator. And in the end, all elements that we're looking at will be um, elements generated by G. Now for Diffie Hellman to work, we don't even need to be able to compute inverses. So in principle, a semi-group would be enough. And now these coat of arms and locks and so on turn into very simple objects. So the private key is simply a positive integer. And the public key is the generator raised to this private key, so to this integer. So Alice's public key is g to the a, and Bob's public key is g to the b. Now, how can we combine, say, Alice's secret key a with Bob's public key g to the b? Now, she can compute Bob's public key to her private power b, uh, a. So that gives us the hb to the a that you see there. And then, well, you have an exponentiation of an exponentiation. So you have two numbers in the exponent. And that means you have the product in the exponent. So you're getting g to the ab. But we can just change the order of the parentheses. And then we can turn it into something that Bob can compute. Because Bob knows lowercase b, and he knows Alice's h sub a, and so he can compute Alice's h sub a to the power of b. And both of them now have computed g to the a b. And then they take this group element, run it through a suitable hash function, and use that as their key. So then they have their 256 bits plus whatever. So they need their block cipher or stream cipher key, and they need their Mac key. And that is just the hash of this G to the AB. Now, this was in 1976 when Diffie and Hellman introduced the term public key cryptography. They come up with this method, and there's a little bit of disappointment in them when they say, well, they don't actually have an encryption system, they have a key exchange system. Now, nowadays, the Diffie Hellman key exchange actually is more widespread 
than RSA because we realize that all we want is just the way to send uh, symmetric keys. I mean, we want to use symmetric key cryptography for the bulk of the message, and so we don't need RSA where we can send a message under our control. We just want to send a key. And that works perfectly well with DP Hellman because we don't need to decide the key, we can just derive the key from the G to the AB. Now, in order to use this, well, everybody needs to know how to compute in G, everybody needs to know the little gen G as a generator, and we also need to have a safe choice of G. So let's see some unsafe choices. So if you would be using the rational numbers with multiplication, say you take generator 2, so you're not actually getting the whole group of the rational numbers, you're getting a subgroup of that, then if you're seeing that Alice's key is 65536, all right, you can either convert that quickly to binary to see what it is, or you have to know that this just means it's 2 to the 16. So you can just look at how many bits the number has, because it's 2 to the number. That means as many zeros as there are in the binary representation, that's the exponent. So that is absolutely insecure. In the exercise session on Thursday, you'll see another group which is insecure, namely the additive group of a fine field. So that takes away the issue that the length gives away um, all information about what the exponent was. But now, well, what does it actually mean to be the exponent? So Alice, in this case, instead of computing g to the a, well, the group operation is addition. So that means you're applying the group operation to a copies of g. That means g plus g plus b plus, plus g. That just means a times g. And you might already now see um, how to get a from this. Or else, well, think about it a bit more, and it's going to be some examples on Thursday. Now, what Diffie and Hellman actually suggested was to use the multiplicative group of a fine field, and they wanted to have G to be a primitive element, that means a generator of the whole group. So you, they wanted something where the G runs through all the power, the powers of G run through all elements of the group. Nowadays, it's more common to actually take a subgroup where the generator has a large prime order. Well, so if, if p is odd, then p minus 1, which is the order of the multiplicative group, always has this extra factor of 2. And we don't like these extra factors. They give us problems in certain security proofs, and they even lead to some insecurities. So we want to have large prime order. And what we're now seeing more and more on the internet is actually a group of points on the elliptic curve, now that we don't cover in this lecture, you should stay on for next year's for the master's course um, to MSC 10, so that's the cryptology course, where you're going to see the details of how elliptic curve cryptography works. Okay, so what do we actually believe is hard for the attacker? So related to the diffie hellman key exchange, there are three problems. So there is the computation diffie hellman problem, which is the most immediate problem that you're seeing there. So that is the problem that Eve is facing. She's seen, she knows the generator, she's seen the public keys of Alice and Bob, and she wants to have their shared secret. And so, well, if Eve can break that, then she can break the security of the system because that is the key that gives me all the information for the symmetric key system. Sometimes we actually I have already a problem if, uh, if Eve is a little bit less powerful, or rather we want to make sure that our system is even secure against this attack, where Eve already wins if she can just decide whether this G to the C is actually G to the AB or not. And that's called the decisional Diffie-Hellman problem. So Eve is presented with a triple, well, everybody knows G, G to the A, G to the B, and then Eve also gets some g to the c, and it's 50-50. It's either some random power of g, or it is g to the ab. And there you already see one example of why it matters whether g has prime order or whether it's composite, because else you can maybe get something about whether the exponent is even or not, and therefore get a higher than 50% chance of breaking it. Now the real problem that we normally study is the discrete logarithm problem, which is to just get Alice's secret key. So given the generator, 
given else is public key, computer private key A. Now, if you can solve the discrete logarithm problem, then you can also solve the computational Diffie-Hellman problem and you can solve the decisional Diffie-Hellman problem. If you can solve the computational Diffie-Hellman problem, then you also can solve the decisional Diffie-Hellman problem. So there's a hierarchy of these problems. One direction is very clear and there are some groups where you can also solve the DLP by solving slightly more complicated instances of the uh, computational Diffie-Hellman problem. But the decisional Diffie-Hellman problem can be easier than the other two. Now, of course, you want groups where all three of them are hard. And so the groups that I mentioned before, the fine field, the prime order subgroup of a fine field, and the elliptic curve group, those are good examples. Now, there are some problems with the Diffie-Hellman problem, with the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So I've been talking about Alice and Bob talking and Eve just being passively in the middle. But Eve is not necessarily a passive attacker. If Eve is an active attacker and is willing to relay messages between Alice and Bob and actually intercept all messages coming from Alice going directly to Bob, then Eve can mount what is called a man-in-the-middle attack. Yeah, we're a little bit weird that we always talk about Eve as the attacker, but then we talk about the man in the middle rather than the woman in the middle. Also, when we say the attacker, then it's a he most of the time, whereas if we need the eavesdropper or an active attacker, even then, when we say Eve, then it's of course a she. Now, what happens here is that um, Alice is trying to send a message to Bob, as we had on the previous picture, but then when Alice sends her G to the A, it gets intercepted by Eve. And Eve, pretending to be Bob, sends back her G to the E. Now at this point, Alice and Eve have a shared key G to the AE. But probably Alice actually wants to have some information from Bob, which Eve doesn't know. And so Eve has to ensure that Alice actually can get information from Bob. So what Eve then does is she pretends to be Alice towards Bob and mounts another key exchange. So she's then taking some G to the F, saying, hey Bob, I'm Alice, let's talk. Here's my key share of the day, here's my G to the F. And then Bob says, okay, well, let's talk, here's my G to the B. And now also Eve and Bob have a shared key. And now every time that Alice wants to send a message to Bob, Eve has to stay in the middle. She has to take this message, which is encrypted with the key that she and Alice know. She decrypts it and then re-encrypts it to the key that she and Bob knows. And if something comes from Bob's, then again, uh, from Bob, then again she decrypts it and re-encrypts it to Alice. So as long as Eve persistently stays in the middle and continues to decrypt and re-encrypt and push the messages each way, then you can't detect this attack. Now, if Alice actually knows Bob's key, then, well, she wouldn't be saying, hey, Bob, send me a key. She just knows that, ah, their shared secret is due to the AB. But you also don't want to have the same key the whole time because, well, I mean, then you don't need public key cryptography if all you're ever using is due to the AB. You can just know this once and then don't ever talk again. So typically you want to have some form of key freshness. So you kind of want to mix in something new um, but this slide should serve as a, as a motivation to think about how could you take, say, a long-term secret key or a short-term secret key, combine them in a certain way, but you still can avoid having even the middle. Solution will come um, early next year, so we're actually going to co cover some more or less um, working attempts at um, making this more secure. Now, another possibility is that actually Alice and Bob have some form of comparing their keys. And that's what you see in many of the messaging systems nowadays, for instance, Signal and WhatsApp. You can uh, compare some short string, a fingerprint, or you can compare a QR code. And that's basically, well, if Alice and Eve has a shared key and Eve and Bob have a shared key, these shared keys are different. And so if they get a fingerprint of the key, they will realize, hey, wait a second, we're not talking to one another there's something happening in the middle. So if they have a way to compare the keys out of band, if they 
know each other socially, they can meet actually, or if they can at least call each other, then they can detect this and stop it. But again, if they know each other and can meet, then they could also exchange a secret key that way. So this is actually a real problem. Um, one solution that you do know already is that Alice and Bob both could have long-term RSA signature keys and they could just sign, um, hey, I'm Alice, this is my G2B A. And this is not so far-fetched. This is actually what your computer is doing when it talks to many of the internet sites that it does a Diffie Hellman key exchange for the encryption security. So that is getting a fresh key each and every time. And it sends, well, the server sends a signature using its RSA key on their share being actually by them. Now, on the internet, you don't have to authenticate normally unless you have a client side certificate, which is fairly uncommon still, but at least you're getting a server side. Now, on the situation that I just mentioned, um, where we have that the server is a permanent place, so like in this case, Alice is going to be our server, and then Bob is the random client who is connecting to it, then Alice might be having also a long-term public key. So Alice might have actually a certificate saying, hey, this is my long-term Diffie-Hellman key, and then other users can do what is called a semi-static Diffie-Hellman key exchange with her, um, which is closest to what Diffie-Hellman gets to public key encryption. But it's a different concept. It's not public key encryption. It is a mix of public key and symmetric key. And when you have these, these mixes, then we call them a hybrid system. Actually, you can formalize this into what is called a chem and a dem, but that is a material for another lecture. All right, let's see what the semi-static Diffie-Hellman is doing. So Alice has published at some point a long-term public key, and well, she better keeps that private key very, very safe, because well, that's going to be used for all her communication. So everybody knows that Alice belongs, uh, owns this G to the A, and that once you get something which is compatible with this, you really talk to Alice, you're not talking to Eve. Now, communicating with Alice, you actually want to have some key freshness. So you will pick a random new exponent, let's call this thing k, and then you compute your Diffie-Hellman public key g to the k. Now, that's going to be an ephemeral key, so that's not for long term. This is just for this communication, or maybe using this for a few Alice's, like you're using it for the current connection, and you might also use it for something else. Nowadays, honestly, crypto is so fast. Your number generation is so fast, you shouldn't need to worry about reusing keys. And you better than don't reuse keys. All right, so then um, you compute this R, and you also compute the key that you would be sharing with Alice. Because, well, you know your secret key, you know this K, and you can compute Alice's public key to your K. So that is the shared key that you have with Alice. And then you can compute the hash of that. That's all you need for the symmetric keys. And then you can use that symmetric key to actually encrypt the message you have into a some ciphertext. So that's the confidentiality, integrity, and authenticity of the connection. And then you also send this R so that Alice can actually recover the same symmetric key. So Alice, when she gets the ciphertext and this R, she takes R, and just like in the Diffie Hellman key exchange, she computes your public key, so this R to her private key, to the A, and that gets you her the same G to the A key, K, that you had obtained. And so then she has a symmetric key, and she can just take the ciphertext that you sent and decrypt it from there. So Alice's key is static, Bob's key is ephemeral. And you should watch out when you're reading ephemeral, it doesn't actually mean one time. The word is non-permanent, but that doesn't mean you can rely on it never being used again. There are some implementations where ephemeral is actually a few times. But you can't, so you can't rely on it being around, but you also can't rely on it being uh, deleted instantly. But you can sort of rely on it being gone after some time interval. So, um, that's how we see Diffie Hellman being used in practice, typically as a semi-static or as a slightly more complicated combination 
of using long-term public keys with short-term public keys on both Alice's and Bob's side. Thank you.